In just a moment, Pastor Greg is going to be here to give us a special Father's Day message. But uh, I know many of you kind of wanted to get a little taste of what happened at Harvest America. We've got a little bit of a video here for you guys to look at, and then Greg will be right up. So um, turn your attention to the screen. There's not a person in this room that deserves to be here, and especially on that platform. But in your uh, grace, you chose us and placed us in this role. We're not really sure why, but we're thankful for it. And so we think of what John the Baptist said, I must decrease and he must increase. So Lord, these gifts are from you. Every gift that's in this room is from you. And so we dedicate the gift back to you. But now Lord, we ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on everything that is said and done, every announcement made, every song sung, everything shared, every sermon preached, and all oh, Lord, for all those tech guys to do, there's so many moving parts with sound and video and, and all the things happening, Lord, and be with them in a special way. They need an anointing to do their job as well. We pray you would bind the power of the devil. He hates evangelism. And so we pray that you'll just put a hedge of protection around this venue and let your gospel go out in great power and may great glory be offered to your name. And we want to do this for your glory tonight. So cleanse us of our sin, known and unknown, Lord, and fill us with the Holy Spirit. We commit ourselves to you. We present ourselves to you as living sacrifices. So we ask your blessing now as we go out, go before us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Aloha, everybody. How are you? So that's where I was last Sunday. Uh, that's an event we've been working on and praying for for months and months and months. And, uh, and so we had a combined attendance of 100,000 people. 
So we're very thankful for that. And then 10,000 people that you saw that made a profession of faith to follow Christ. So let's remember them in our prayers now that that seed would take root in their hearts. All right, well, today is Father's Day. How many fathers do we have? Raise your hand up if you're a dad. Why don't you all stand, gentlemen? Stand up for a moment. Look at these guys. That's fantastic. You know, uh, as my way of honoring you today, I would like you to remain standing for my whole message. <laughs> no, but let's pray for these guys. What do you think? Everybody just put a hand on their shoulder and their back and let's pray for these men. Father, I pray for every man standing right now. Lord, first of all, I thank you that they're in church today. There's a lot of places they could be, a lot of things they could be doing, but they made a decision to be here. So bless them in a special way. Bless their families. Bless their children. Bless them as they lay a legacy. And Lord, we honor them, and we thank you for them, and we commit each one to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, dads. Thank you so much. You know, to me it says, I'm going to take this off. It said it right there. Yeah. So you can all admire it. Uh, you know, I think the fact that you're in church today says a lot about you, quite honestly. And so I want to thank you for being here today, especially on Father's Day, because the reality is uh, one of the best attended days at church is Mother's Day. <laughs> and one of the lower days of attendance for church is, what do you think? That's right, Father's Day. So it's like, Mom, what do you want to do? It's Mother's Day. She'll say, I want to go to church with a whole family. Okay, Mom. So, Dad, it's Father's Day. What do you want to do? I want to stay home, and I want a barbecue, and I want to sleep. <laughs> you know, so, no, but you didn't say that, did you? Now, you can sleep and barbecue later. That's fine. But for now, you're at church, and we're glad of it. You know, it's a funny thing. Uh, on Mother's Day the most phone calls are made of any day of the year. More people call their moms and use their phones on Mother's Day. Most phone calls made. And guess what happens on Father's Day? The most collect calls are made. <laughs> See, they really do need us though, don't they? Right, guys? That just cracks me up. You know, uh, superhero films are very popular right now, as you probably noticed. Um, you have the DC uh, superheroes like Superman and Batman and, and uh, Wonder Woman. And then you've got the uh, Marvel Universe with uh, Iron Man and all those characters that they have. I watched one of them recently. I think it was called Avengers Infinity War. It had the Hulk, Iron Man, Star-Lord, and a raccoon. I don't know what the deal was with the raccoon. If you saw this film, I watched this film. There was so much CG madness in it. They had about 20 storylines going at the same time. I walked out and I said, I have no idea what just happened, but I had a good nap and ate some popcorn, so it's all good, right? But, you know, we like to celebrate superheroes. The problem is they're not real. But I think there's a real superhero in our culture today. And I think it's a father that does what God has called him to do. They really stand out from other men. I'm talking about a dad that stays married to his wife, I'm talking about a father who raises godly children to follow the Lord. I'm talking a man who holds his ground. And you know, it's always sort of assumed that fathers would be there. Society is so dependent upon them, but a phenomena is happening in America today where fathers are disconnecting from families at a record rate. Uh, one study said that at the beginning of the 21st century, men are choosing to disconnect from family life on a massive scale, and we're in danger of becoming a fatherless society. Listen to this. You could take almost every social ill in America today and trace it back to A, the broken home, and B, the absence of a father. I can back that up with a lot of stats. Uh, consider this, fatherless children are anywhere from 100 to 200% more likely to have emotional and behavioral problems. 63% of teenagers who attempt suicide are from fatherless homes. 
Um, 71% of high school dropouts from fatherless homes. 90% of all homeless and runaway children from fatherless homes. Fatherless sons are 300% more likely to become incarcerated in state juvenile institutions. Fatherless daughters who marry have a 92% higher divorce rates. Fatherless daughters are 53% more likely to marry as teenagers. Listen to this one. Fatherless daughters are 111% more likely to have children as teenagers and 164% more likely to have an out-of-wedlock birth, you see. And listen to this one. I just discovered this. This was kind of mind-blowing to me. 27 of the deadliest mass shooters, 26 of them were from fatherless homes. So we always want to point to this other thing. that No, it's the breakdown of the family, I'm telling you. Because a family can survive without a nation. But a nation cannot survive without the family. So I want to say a word to you single moms out there that are doing a really hard job. God bless you. And we're so thankful you're holding the fort down, you know, because you play an important role. But for you dads, for you dads that are doing your part, a special blessing on you today. And here's another thing to consider, because some of you are probably disconnecting from this message, because A, you're a woman. You're saying, you know, uh, this has no effect on me. It actually does, as you'll see in a few moments. I'm going to share some principles that will help you in your parenting that are both for men and women. But some of you are young and you're saying, I'm not a parent yet. But chances are you'll be a parent one day. All of these principles we're going to share relate to you. But listen, let's just say you don't have a dad. And this is kind of a hard day for you. And sometimes it is. Father's Day could just have a whole lot more baggage than Mother's Day for some reason, right? You have a tense relationship with your father. You haven't spoken to him for a while. Or you have a a tense relationship with your kids and they haven't spoken to you for a while. Or maybe you never had a father like me. I never had a dad growing up. Uh, I was conceived out of wedlock. You know my story. My mom was married and divorced a hundred times. I've changed the number now. It's a (laughs) hundred. Because that sounds better than seven, but um, seven's the real number. But the fact is, I never had a father figure. But here's the cool thing that happened. After I became a Christian, I found father figures in the church. And maybe you don't have a biological father doing his part, but there can be a godly man that can step into that role. And more specifically, you can be that godly man to step into that role. Sitting here in church is uh, Don. You call him Papa, right? Right here, Papa Don. So uh, we ran, we ran into Don the other day. He, the, he was playing bocce ball with Freddie and his wife. Uh, is that what you call a bocce ball? Right. And that, so we were watching them play, and he was trying to show me how to throw it, and I was horrible at it. But. Um, So, you know, I've talked with Don over the years, of course, but I spoke a little bit more and asked him a lot of questions. And it came to my attention that Don spends a lot of his time mentoring young people. And, uh, you know, he takes them under his wing and he helps them. And so this is the thing. You can be that father figure for somebody else that really needs it. Uh, And I'm talking about young boys and young girls. God has a place for masculine leadership in the world and in the church just as surely as he is a place for feminine leadership in the world and the church. One is not better than the other, but they are very different from each other and both are equally important. That's why we want to do this God's way. By the way, that's not just true in the world of humanity. It's also true in the animal kingdom. A friend of mine named James Merritt wrote an interesting book Uh, titled Being Fathers in a Fatherless World. He told the story of what was happening at Kruger National Park. It has the largest wildlife, uh, it's the largest wildlife preserve in South Africa. 30 years ago, apparently, the elephant population was exceeding the park's ability to sustain it, so they killed off some of the adults and they relocated some of the younger elephants. These young bulls were resettled in Palinsburg National Park. All seemed well for a period of time, a couple of years, and then a serious problem began to develop. They noticed that rhinos were being slaughtered. And they thought, who's killing the rhinos? They thought initially it was poachers, and they discovered it was not 
poachers, it was young bull elephants killing rhinos. What they were doing is they were goring them with their tusks. And as it turns out, these elephants had formed like gangs with their own leaders. It was bizarre. And so they thought, how do we solve this? And so they brought a bunch of the older male elephants over to them, sort of a foster father, big brother project. And within a short period of time, order was restored. The older elephants modeled for the younger elephants uh, the way to react. And so what does this mean to our culture today? We need large male elephants roaming the streets <laughs> to bring order. No, I'm kidding. But uh, you get the idea. It was the presence of masculine leadership. One expert said it's the presence of father figures that's essential to civil behavior, discipline, and rational decorum. And so it's a great blessing to be a dad. Psalm 127. And by the way, we're going to end up in uh, Ephesians 6. So I should have told you to turn over to that earlier. Uh, we'll go to that in a moment. But uh, before we get to Ephesians 6, one, Psalm 127 says, Children are a heritage from the Lord, a reward from Him. The word heritage can be translated a gift. Children are a gift. We don't own our kids, parents. They are ours to discover, to develop. They are theirs, they're ours not to control but to encourage. Our children are not ours to mold but to unfold. Every child is different. Every child has a particular bend in their personality and in their direction. It's sort of pre-wired in them. It's for us there to help them discover what that is. You know, sometimes I'll run into parents and they'll say, we haven't had any problems raising our children. Our children are so well-behaved. They're so respectful. They're the best kids ever. And I'll say, well, how old are your kids? Oh, two and three. I just say, you know what? Shut up. Because you don't... You don't know what you're talking about. Come back to me after you've raised teenagers and maybe I'll listen to you. I'm reminded of the advice that Mark Twain gave years ago. He said, quote, things run along pretty smoothly until your kid reaches 13. That's a time you need to stick him in a barrel, <laughs> hammer the lid down nice and snug, and feed him through the knot hole. And then he says, around the time they turn 16, plug up the knot hole. <laughs> guess he had the same problems we have even back in those days. So we need to look to the Lord, of course, to do these things and to find the right place that we play. Now let's go to Ephesians 6. Very familiar passage. Fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So Paul tells us as dads what we should do and what we should not do. First of all, he says, don't provoke your children. That means to anger your children. It speaks of repeated pattern of behavior or treatment. It causes the child to have anger and resentment that overflows to outright hostility. How do we anger our children or provoke them? Uh, here's a few principles if you're taking notes down. Number one, one way to provoke our children is by showing favoritism. It's up on the screen if you're writing it down. It's to show favoritism. Favoring one child over another. And by the way, your kids know when you have a favorite, right? You think you cover it up, they know. Kids are smart. I was with my granddaughter Allie the other day and she had climbed up in a tree and so she said, Papa, who's your favorite grandchild? And I know what she wanted the answer to be. And I said, you are my favorite grandchild, her face lit up, sitting in a tree at this moment. <laughs> no, Papa, who's your favorite grandchild? What grandchild do you like the best? Is it me or Lucy or Stella or Riley or Chris or who's your favorite? I went back to that answer. She didn't like it. And you know, it's hard because you might favor one over another, but that can create problems that literally go into adulthood. And that's found right in the pages of Scripture. I mean, look at the story of Jacob and Esau. Uh, Isaac, their father, Isaac favored one son and his wife favored another. Isaac favored Esau, Rebekah favored Jacob. 
that turned into a rivalry that lasted for the rest of their life. Now you would have thought Jacob would have learned from that and would have never shown favoritism, but then he favored his son Joseph. Remember his coat of many colors, right? So all the other boys were out working in the field hard and Joseph would sashay up in his super cool psychedelic coat and say, hey bros, how's it going? And then he would go and rat out his brothers and you know how that story went. They decided to sell him into slavery and, and that's a whole nother story. But again, favoritism created problems. You don't want to favor one child over another. Number two, another way you can provoke your children is by never complimenting them. You know, when I grew up, I was never affirmed. My mom never said, Greg, that's great. That's wonderful. You're doing a good job. She just basically said nothing to me. She never said, I love you. And, and sometimes dads, it's hard for us to say that. I don't know why it is, because we feel the love. You know, sometimes it's said, well, men are not as emotional as women. Nonsense. Men are emotional. They just try to mask it. They feel all the emotions you do. When you're in that theater and that sad scene comes on and the puppy was hit by a car and maybe the girl's just like owning it and crying, the guy, trust me, he's fighting back the tears. He's like, <coughs> allergies. <laughs> we have all the emotions you have. But for some reason, it's a little harder for us to express them. I remember hearing Dr. Dobson say years ago that when we're born, at a certain stage, the mind of a young baby boy is flooded with testosterone and he says and it breaks things down in the mind. And as a young baby girl, uh, females have their minds flooded with estrogen. And so he says whatever it is, it damages the mind of the male. So here's the explanation. Guys are brain damaged. <laughs> so whatever it is, uh, we want to be able to express affirmation to a child. You did a great job. You know, I love you. I'm proud of you. That, that's wonderful what you did. Now we're living in a day where maybe we've gone from one extreme to another. Where we're over praising our children. Right? I mean, they'll be in a competitive event and everybody's a winner. I went to a soccer match for my granddaughters a while back and they have really cute names like purple princesses and things like that. And I'm watching the game and um, and I asked somebody, what's the score? And someone says, we don't keep score. Thought, <laughs> then some dad said, four to two. So, you know, it's just like, because <laughs> everybody's a winner. You're so wonderful. You're the best. And we overpraise our children. And that is as much as a disservice as underpraising our children. Because then they go out there and they think, well, the world owes me everything and I'm so awesome. And where's my avocado toast and my luxurious latte? because I'm a millennial, so get ready. Well, we have to prepare our kids for the real world, right? And so you can overpraise, you can underpraise. You want to find that right balance. You know, it's interesting. Uh, it says that you're to bring them up in the admonition of the Lord. It doesn't say knock them down. It says bring them up. We need to build our children up. Why do we need to bring them up and build them up? Because their sinful nature brings them down. I have two sons. I already mentioned I have five grandchildren. Uh, I never had to teach my boys how to sin. It came naturally to them. You know, I think probably their first words were mine, right? And uh, so this is something we all have. We have a sinful nature. As David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. So my job as a parent is to not just produce a good kid or a well-mannered kid or a polite kid, though I think that's important, but it is to produce a godly kid. I can't make my child believe, but I want to do everything that I can to point them to Jesus Christ and then bring them to a life of faith. How do you do that? Number one, you do it by modeling it for them. Before you can tell someone how to live, show them how to do it. Be that example for your child. And then number two, you look for opportunities every day to help that young person grow. Uh, in Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 7, uh, Moses says some important things. He says, I'm commanding you today. Let these things be in your heart. Teach them to your sons 
and talk of them when you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and you rise up. So just all day long, look for opportunities to impart truth into the lives of your children. And then if God blesses you, into the lives of your grandchildren. And for some even, into the lives of your great-grandchildren. You know that phrase, train up a child in the way that they should go, and when they are old they will not depart from it, is often misunderstood. What does it mean to train up a child in the way that they should go? The phrase train up actually in its original usage speaks of the actions of a midwife after delivering a child would dip her finger into crushed grapes, excuse me, crushed dates, and then put her finger into the mouth of the newborn, causing the newborn to crave milk, to want to be nursed. And so the idea of it in training up, it could better be translated, create a thirst in your child for the Lord. And I think one of the things I will do that is by modeling for them what it means to walk with the Lord. I remember hearing Ann Graham Lotz, the daughter of Billy and Ruth Graham, talk about the profound impact that her mother's example made on her. How she would go into her mother's room and it would just be filled with open Bibles and Bible study books and she would see how important that was to her mother and that legacy was effectively passed on. You can talk about it, but when you do it, it's the best sermon of all. So stimulate a thirst in your child. But it's interesting also because it can also be translated to speak of breaking a horse, bringing a horse into submission. So it's establishing parameters. Uh, when I was raising my boys, I always taught them to be respectful. And I said, when you meet someone, especially an adult, you look them in the eyes, you, you're polite, you never disrespect your mother ever. And if you do, we have trouble, you and me. And so you have these rules in the house. So you're stimulating a thirst in them, but at the same time, you're providing parameters for them, lines that should not be crossed. I know some parents say, well, I, I just don't want to be a parent. I want to be a, the best friend of my child. Your child can find plenty of best friends. There's only one mom and there's only one dad. That's right. Amen. Don't be their best friend. That's right. Be their parent. That's, right. That's what they need. And I've even heard some parents say, well, I would never go into my child's room and snoop around. I respect their privacy. No way, man. <laughs> they live under my roof. I'm going in their room. I'm looking under the bed. I'm looking at books they look at. I'm going to go and look at what websites they're looking at. Why? Because I love them. That's right. Because I care about them. And their brains are this big still. And I want to help them <laughs> before they get themselves into trouble. So it's the idea of establishing the parameters. Breaking the horse, that's interesting. I think I've told you the story before of a preacher who bought a horse. And uh, you know he wanted to be spiritual. And he thought, I don't want to say giddy up. I want to use a spiritual term. So he said, I know. When I want the horse to go, I'll say, praise the Lord. How many of you have heard the story? Raise your hand. Okay. Oh, excellent. Okay, good. <laughs> so when I, want, when I want the horse to go, the preacher says, I'll say, praise the Lord, instead of giddy up. And I want to, when I want the horse to stop, I'll say, hallelujah. And the horse will stop. So he's out riding around, and all of a sudden the horse just took off into a full gallop. He's going, ho, ah, uh, ah, uh, whoa, whoa. What? That wasn't working. Oh, what was the word for stop again? Oh, uh, glory to God. Horse is still running. Uh, Jesus is coming. Horse is still running. Now he's headed toward a cliff. He's almost at the edge of the cliff. What is the word for stop? What's the word for stop? Oh, hallelujah. The horse stops right on the edge. Some pebbles going over the side. Preacher wipes his brow and says, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> Okay, that's all you remember from this sermon. I just know it. <laughs> but then you get to be a grandparent one day, maybe. How many of your grandparents? Raise your hand. Yeah. Quite a few grandparents here. That's great. By the way, grandchildren are the reward for the pain of parenting yes. <laughs> and the punishment to your children for the misery they put you through. <laughs> right? The best dads get promoted to grandpa, the best moms to grandma. Grandfathers are daddies with extra practice, right? right. And, and here's your objective when you're a grandparent. It's so great. It's so different from parenting. When you're a grandparent, you go to pick up your grandchildren, and my grandchildren will be joining me uh, in the next few days, so they'll be running around the church. You'll meet, meet them all. But uh, here are the, here's the to-do list for grandparents. 
Pick up your grandchildren. Number one. Number two, spoil your grandchildren. Number three, load up your grandchildren with sugar. Yeah. Number four, return your grandchildren <laughs> to your parents. Until next time. When I'm with my grandkids, they'll get in the car, I say, and you like this, don't you, right, Pooh Bear? I say, the fun begins now. Now, I mean, if they're, you know, doing something disrespectful or naughty, I'm going to deal with it. But I'm not there to primarily parent them. I'm there to grandparent them, right? And there's a big difference. But here's something to keep in mind. Even godly kids go astray. Jesus told what we call the parable of the prodigal son. And uh, it's a story of, uh, you know the story, a father had two sons. The youngest son wanted his part of the estate that was due to him. He didn't want to wait till his dad grew old and died. Loose paraphrase, he said, Dad, I'm tired of waiting for you to bite the dust. I want my inheritance now. Amazingly, the father gave it to him, and the boy ran off, blew all his money, drugged the family name to the gutter, finally came to his senses, realized what a horrible son he had been, in fact, he didn't even think he deserved to be a son any longer. He determined he'd just go back home and ask his dad if he'd take him on as a hired hand. I mean, even the guys that just worked for his dad had it better than this boy at the moment who was hanging out with pigs and eating the food he was feeding them. And of course, Jesus tells the story to show us what God the Father is like. And while the boy was yet a great way off, Jesus said the father saw him, ran to him, threw his arms around him and kissed him and welcomed him home and said, let's have a luau. This my son who is dead is alive again. He who was lost is found. Amen. But here's the point. I think this boy had a good home. Clearly he had an affectionate father. Clearly he had a dad who missed him, but he went astray. And sometimes I think we feel when our kids, you know, go astray or they don't share the faith that we've hopefully passed on to them that we are just a dismal failure as a parent. Well, if that's the case, then God is a failure as God. Because does not our Father in heaven have a lot of prodigal sons and daughters? Okay, so keep that in mind. That doesn't mean you haven't done your job. It means they have a free will and they can make bad choices. But here's something to remember. A study was done. And they found if mother and father attend church regularly, 72% of their children will go on to remain uh, faithful church attenders. So if mom and dad go to church, take your kids to church, 72% chance your kids will do that for their kids. If only mom attends church regularly, 15% of the kids will go on and do that themselves. If only dad does it, 55% will remain faithful. If neither mom nor dad attend church regularly, only 6% of the children will remain faithful. That concerns me. Because sometimes they see Christian families at Sunday, you want to go to church? I don't know. It, you know, is there a break? I'm thinking of playing golf. Like, what? Do you realize how important this is to be here right now? You know, it's not just about hearing this sermon. It's not just about doing worship. It's not just about giving. Those things all have their place. It's also just about obedience and setting an example for your kids. And they'll remember that you always had time for church. You always had time for the things of the Lord. You're sending a message to your kids and to your grandkids every single day. But sometimes they will go astray. And when that happens, we should never give up on them. Never give up on your kids. Because they can escape your presence, but they can never escape your prayers. Keep praying for them. And that prodigal eventually returned home again. Uh, of course, I, I mentioned I have two sons. And you know, both of my sons had their prodigal years. My oldest son, Christopher, uh, was always respectful and always believed in Jesus. But he spent quite a few years out partying his life away. And uh, he later told Levi Lusco, who's preaching at our church in California today, who is a friend of Christopher. He said, I could use my father as a barometer for where I was at with God. When I was right with God, I was right with my dad. When I wasn't right with God, there was tension with my dad and myself. But I always loved Christopher. 
and he knew I loved him. And I always kept communication open, even when he did things that disappointed me. And one day the Lord got hold of his heart and he returned to Jesus. And uh, then he uh, met a girl named Brittany. I have two daughters-in-law named Brittany. Isn't that hilarious? Two, you know? And uh, so he met a girl named Brittany and they got married. They had a little daughter, Stella. Another daughter was on the way, a little Lucy. And uh, we didn't know this was going to happen, of course, but Christopher was called unexpectedly home to heaven. Uh, worst day of our life. We still miss him each and every day. But I'll say this. Uh, we're so glad he came back home to his father in heaven as well as to his father on earth. And now he's with his father. So we're thankful. And Christopher had a conversation with his brother Jonathan like the day before Christopher died. And Jonathan was struggling with drugs. And uh, we didn't know how badly until later. But Christopher said to his brother, what's it going to take, Jonathan, to get you to open your eyes? This is after Christopher had rededicated his life to Christ. Well, it was that horrible event that woke up Jonathan, and he committed his life to the Lord. And now not only is he walking with the Lord, but he's Pastor Jonathan Lorry. And uh, he'll be with us next Sunday morning. And uh, you'll get to meet him for yourself. But you know, the Lord intervened and worked in the lives of these young men. And I'm so thankful for that. Never give up on your kids. I was uh, watching a documentary film the other night. Actually, Jim told me about it. It was about David Cassidy. It's called The Final Session. Remember David Cassidy? Teen heartthrob. Uh, Jim still has pictures of him on his wall. <laughs> Jim still goes to work. He still goes to work with his Partridge Family Lunchbox, which he alternates between that and his Monkey's Lunchbox. But um, no, he didn't like the. I like the Monkeys. They were okay. They had good songs. Anyway, Jim, none of it was real. They weren't a real band. There wasn't a real family. It was all fake Hollywood stuff. Yeah. More fake than we realize. Because So here's an interesting story. This documentary film is made about David Cassidy, who sadly died last year of liver failure due to his alcoholism. And you may recall that some time ago, David Cassidy came out and publicly said, I have dementia. And, uh, and then he died shortly after that. Well, here's a real story, because he authorized a film to be made about his life and gave total access to these cameras to film him uh, as he was recording a final record called Songs My Father Taught Me. So David Cassidy, his dad was Jack Cassidy, who married David's mother. And then Jack walked out of his life. And David just wanted a relationship with his father. But his father remarried Shirley Jones and had three children with her and uh, was more interested in the lives of those children than the life of his other son, David. And then David went and auditioned for a part to be in a TV show called The Partridge Family about a, a family that is a band. And he won the part and then became an overnight sensation and at one point had a fan club that was bigger than the Beatles or the Rolling Stones. Uh, he, he was, you know, David Cassie, his character was called Keith Partridge. So he had this huge success. Now his father, who wanted nothing to do with him, is threatened by the success of his own son. He's jealous of that success, and the son keeps trying to connect with the father. And, and, uh, and then tragically, uh, uh, the father, Jack Cassidy, is drunk. He's an alcoholic. And one night he falls asleep on his Naga Hyde couch with a cigarette, and the couch catches on fire, and he's burned beyond human recognition. So David loses his father. David goes on to global success and has everything a person could dream of and he's empty and miserable and he quits the show and walks away from it and seemed to spend the rest of his life longing for a father. And then toward the end of his life, he turned to drinking quite heavily and, uh, and he came out in this documentary that was just released after his death and said, I never had dementia. All of this was due to drinking. I brought this on myself. And then he also said, I did it to cover up the emptiness and the sadness. I thought, wow, so sad. So in one of the scenes of the film, he's recording a song his father had recorded, uh, Wish You Were Here is the name of the song. David can't hit the notes. 
And he says, play back my father's recording of the song. So they play his father's recording, which was very impressive. His father had an incredible big Broadway voice, you know. And, and David starts crying. And he says, I miss you, Dad. And then he died not long after that. It was just heartbreaking, you know. His whole life was affected by this. And I just wish I could have sat down with David Cassidy and say, buddy, God can be the father you never had. Maybe your dad failed you, and dads fail sometimes, don't they? But God can step in. And so let, I'm not addressing my final remarks now to dads. I'm addressing these to everyone. I don't know what kind of a relationship you have with your earthly dad. Maybe it's fantastic. Maybe it's challenging. Maybe it's not good. Maybe it's non-existent. Whatever it is, I want you to know one thing. There is a God in heaven who loves you. And he will step in and be the father you never had. And he was that for me. And remember that story that Jesus told. It's a boy that is separated from his father. And why did Jesus tell the story? He told the story to show us what God is like. What is God like? God's like a father who misses his son. And when his son or his daughter goes astray, he longs for their return. And if they will return, God, who is like a father, will run to that child and throw his arms around him or her and tell them he loves them. That's how God feels toward you. Because sometimes that we have kind of a weird relationship with dad, we apply that to God, right? Dad was always critical. God must be that way too. Dad is a certain way. God is that way. Now, if you had a great dad, you think God's like that. So in a way, the fathers play a role in this, but it's just a certain point where you have to disconnect from what your earthly dad was like and realize your father in heaven is different. He loves you and longs for a relationship with you. And maybe some of you have had an emptiness inside of you. Some of you have tried to find happiness in the things that this world offers and you found it doesn't work. Well, God can come into your life and forgive you of all of your sin right now. And I'm talking to dads and moms and sons and daughters and boys and girls, anybody here. If you're not sure that you're right with your Father in heaven, if you're not sure that your sin is forgiven, or if you've been running from God you can come back to him today. You know, we always talk about the prodigal son. Sometimes there's prodigal dads. Fathers that need to come back to the Lord. Prodigal moms. Whoever you are. If you'll admit your sin and call out to him, he will forgive you and welcome you with open arms. And this would be a great day to do that. So in a moment we're going to pray. And if you need Christ in your life, or you've fallen away from him, or you've been a prodigal in some way, shape, or form, you can come back to him again. I'll give you that chance as we close in prayer. Let's all bow our heads. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ, your son, to die on the cross for our sins and to pay the price for every wrong we've ever done. Lord Jesus, thank you for rising again from the dead. And thank you that you are with us in this place right here, right now, standing at the door of our lives and you're knocking. And Lord Jesus, you're saying if we'll hear your voice and open the door, you will come in. So I pray for anyone here that does not know you yet. I pray that this will be the day they come to you and believe. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying together, how many of you today would say, I need Jesus. I am empty. I am lonely. I'm guilty. But I want my life to change. I've made mistakes. I've done things that are wrong. I've sinned. I know it. But I want to be forgiven today. I want to believe in Jesus. Pray for me. If that's your desire, if you want Jesus to come into your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, if you want to know that when you die, you will go to heaven, would you raise your hand up right now? And I would like to pray with you. Just raise your hand up saying, I need Jesus today. God bless you. Raise your hand up higher. I can see it, please. God bless you there in the back. God bless you too. Anybody else? You want his forgiveness? You want to start this relationship with him? Let me pray for you today. If you haven't raised your hand up, raise it now. I'll pray for you. Just lift it up higher. I can see it. Anybody else? Raise your hand up. 
When our heads are still bowed, maybe some of you would say, you know what, I'm a prodigal son. I'm a prodigal daughter. I know it's right, but I've run from it. And I need to get right with God today. I need to come back to him. So pray for me. If that's your desire, if you want to return to Jesus Christ again, raise your hand up and I'll pray for you right now. Raise your hand up high where I can see it. If you need to make that recommitment to Christ, God bless you back there. Anybody else? God bless you too. God bless you. Anybody else? Raise your hand now. Let me pray for you today. I'll wait one more moment. God bless you. God bless you. Young man there? Yes. Awesome. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless all of you. God bless you too. Yes. All right, now I'm gonna ask all of you, if you would please, that raise your hand, making that commitment or recommitment to Christ. I want you to stand to your feet and I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. Just stand up. All of you that raise your hand, even if you did not raise your hand, but you want to make this commitment or recommitment to Christ, just stand up. Stand up wherever you are. You heard me right. Stand up and I'll lead you in this simple prayer. God bless you. You're not the only one standing. Others are standing. Just stand up now. And let me lead you in this prayer. Stand to your feet. And we'll pray together. God bless you. I'll wait another moment. Just stand up. You gotta own this. If you're gonna do it, you gotta own it. Because this is just the beginning of what it means to be a Christian. So don't be embarrassed. Stand to your feet. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else? I'll wait one more moment. Even if you did not raise your hand but you want to make this commitment or recommitment to Christ, stand up now. All right. All of you that are standing, just pray this prayer out loud after me if you would. Again, as I pray, pray this out loud after me. Pray these words, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, but I know you're the Savior who died on the cross for my sin and rose again from the dead. Jesus, I choose to follow you from this moment forward as Savior and Lord, as God and friend. Thank you for calling me and accepting me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you guys that just prayed that prayer. Yes, God bless you. So, Jim, where, where are we gonna, we, where is Freddie? There he is. Okay, this is Freddie, bocce ball champion. And, uh, and he wants to meet you over here. And this is what Freddie's gonna give you. He's gonna give you a red book with a white arrow. What is this? This is a New Testament. And it's, uh, that's part of the Bible, in case you didn't know. And it has some notes in it that I wrote about growing spiritually. So we want you to go home with your own copy of what we call the Start Bible today. So if you would, uh, why don't we all stand to our feet? And you that stood and prayed that prayer with me, why don't you just walk right over here to Freddie? You can still see him even when everyone's standing, you see? And he's holding that Bible up. All of you that prayed that prayer with me, go over there and get your Start Bible. Don't leave today without it. And God bless you guys, and happy Father's Day. <laughs>